Ladies, gentlemen, and internet trolls, welcome back to Fan Fridays, the show where I give outsiders an inside look into the mind of an MLB All-Star. Have you ever wondered what my opinion on the Hall of Fame process is? Stick around, I'll answer that and a lot more right after the break. <laughs> All right, as always, let's start with some questions from YouTube. Question number one, how do you deal with a teammate who is in a slump? Do you leave the coaching staff to deal with it or do you step in and try to offer help yourself? Well, the coaching staff is there to do that job for sure. Generally speaking, when someone's struggling, the coaching staff is the first people they go to. That's the first resource they use. I try to look at myself as a resource. So if anyone comes to me looking for advice, uh, I'm more than happy to share. I actually, uh, I got in trouble for that one time because a, a teammate of mine came to me and asked me for help with a curveball because I have one of the best curveballs in the league and I gave him help with a curveball and then the pitching coach was mad because apparently I was being disrespectful by, to him by trying to help my teammate. So I don't know. I got called in the office and uh, basically told don't try to help your teammates at all. Uh, which is really odd because then if a teammate comes to me and asks a question and then I say, hey, I'm sorry, I can't help you. I, I would love to help you. I have something that can help you, but I'm not allowed to help you. So you should go find someone else. Then I look like a bad teammate. And so when I had to do that because I was being disrespectful to the pitching coach, uh, then I looked like even more of a bad teammate. And then the same organization who told me not to help my teammates got mad at me for being a bad teammate. So that made no sense. But uh, yeah, anyway, I try to look at myself as a resource. Anyone that comes to me whenever via Instagram, in the dugout, via Twitter, YouTube, whatever. I've, had, I've talked to players on uh, FaceTime. I've made breakdowns of their mechanics and sent them to them. Uh, I, I try to help whoever comes uh, and asks. I think I have a lot of information. I'm constantly learning. And expanding my knowledge base. And one of the things I'm most passionate about is helping spread that to other players and making the landscape better overall for players, uh, you know, better when I'm done than when, I'm, than when I started. So yeah, I, uh, if someone comes to me and asks for help, I will certainly try to help them. That's my first, uh, my first reaction. Question number two, how long does it take you to adjust to a new team? Well, it used to take me a couple years uh, because the first year people would look at me like, what the hell is that kid doing? Uh, and they would judge me for it. And then I would perform really well uh, and they would be a little bit mad about it or not sure what to make of it. Oh, it's just a fluke. Uh, and then the second year I would perform really well again. And by the, about the middle of the second year to middle of the third year, they'd be like, oh, well, he does things differently, but he's not that bad of a guy and he's really good on the field and it helps us win. So we're cool with him. So that was uh, high school and college, and then I was not really in at a certain minor league level long enough to have that happen, but then my first couple years in the big leagues, uh, that was definitely the case. Uh, that being said, on my side of things, I wasn't the most social. Uh, I wasn't as good at going and talking to people, uh, just you know, having casual uh, conversation, because the things that I'm interested in are not really the things that other, a lot of other people are interested in. I'd love to talk for hours about physics and you know, baseball training and nutrition and like anything where I'm, con where I'm learning. Yeah. I'm trying to improve my base of knowledge and, and learn. Most other people want to talk about the TV show they watched last night or, you know, the bar they went to or the girl they're talking to or whatever the case is. And those things didn't generally interest me. So I didn't talk a whole lot. Plus I was shy. I mean, my entire time in high school, I was, every time I tried to open my mouth, I was told to shut up. Uh, so I just got really used to not saying anything. And so then people thought, you know, that didn't have that background on me. They thought that I was aloof and didn't care about them and didn't, you know, didn't like them cause I didn't talk to them, stuff like that. So it took me a long time to figure out why people had this perception of me. Cause on my end, I was just shy, you know, and then no one would come talk to me and, be, and then I wouldn't talk to anybody else. And I thought I was getting along fine cause I wasn't doing anything to bother them and you know they weren't doing anything to bother me and so I was like this is a peaceful relationship this is great I'm not being bullied and uh but apparently it was you know they, there was resentment there so I finally figured that out sometime around 2016 2017 and uh then it became you know a lot better from from there on out for me interacting with my teammates and, and coaching staff and stuff like that so that's that answer uh 
Question number three, do you think MLB will ever expand to 32 teams? If so, where would you put one? I do think at some point MLB will expand to 32 teams, but here's a couple things to think about. Attendance is generally declining. Uh, people are less likely to go to baseball games right now than they have been previously. I think that can change. I think we need to make a lot of changes. We need to make ticket prices less. We need to make the overall cost of going to a ball game a lot less. I did a, a video earlier this spring training where I went uh, with my agent, Rachel Luba. We went to a Cubs game and just tried to see how expensive the experience really was for a spring training game. It came out somewhere in the mid hundreds of dollars for two people to go. And, uh, you know, that's just something that has like 150 or something like that. Um, that's on Momentum's channel if you want to check it out. But that's, uh, that's too much, you know. And then that was parking and, and all the different stuff and, you know, concessions, having one meal during the time there. So if you're going to pay that much, the experience has to be really great. And, the, you know, baseball hasn't caught up in a lot of ways to making the experience at the ballpark really, really spectacular, something you can't get anywhere else. So attendance is going down, and that shapes where teams might be put. It used to be you needed to put a team in a location where a lot of people were there and were going to go to the games. Now, sure, that's still the case, but now it's mostly about the media markets. The teams make most of their money on TV deals, both season, regular season and postseason deals. Um, they make less and less of their money on live gate dollars. So that opens up a lot more areas. I do think, though, that um, if MLB was going to expand, they would probably try to expand to a foreign market. Uh, that could be Toronto. Or I'm sorry, uh, Montreal. Uh, Canada has one team in Toronto. I think Montreal would love to have uh, a team back. Um, I think they may try to go into uh, Puerto Rico in some capacity. I know they've uh, played some games in Puerto Rico, played some games in Mexico, played some games in Europe. Uh, Europe just is logistically extremely tough with the time difference and the travel. Uh, but Puerto Rico is close enough and Mexico is close enough uh, to the rest of the teams that that would be viable. So my guess is um, somewhere in one of those markets, Puerto Rico, Mexico, or, uh, or Canada, uh, probably Montreal if it's, uh, if it's Canada. Uh, but I don't think expansion is coming anytime soon. I think that we have a lot of issues in the game right now that are uh, kind of rearing their ugly heads, and it's a really critical time for baseball to figure those out before we try to expand. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, anyway, all right, now for some questions from my fans at trevorbauer.com. I appreciate all of you checking out my website and engaging with me there. So thank you, as always, for that. Um, question number four comes from Aaron Thorne, who asks, how often is the pitcher in charge during an at-bat versus the catcher, specifically in the majors? Any tips for upcoming catchers to help them be more helpful to pitchers or tips for pitchers to be more helpful to catchers? Um, that really depends on the individual. And I guess these are all kind of tied together, uh, both questions that you have. The catcher and the pitcher need to be on the same page with whatever it's going to be. Um, at the end of the day, the pitcher's throwing the ball and it's his game. It's you know, he gives up runs. It goes on his ERA. He gets the loss. He gets the, you know, the, he gets the questions in the media of why were you bad today or why were you good today? You know, that when the, when the media talks to the catcher, they ask, you know, well, what did you see from the pitcher today? Uh, so at the end of the day, it's the pitcher's game. Um, he needs to be convicted in what he's throwing. He needs to feel confident in it. So as a catcher, it's just about getting on the same page with him on that. You know, put yourself second as a catcher and say, okay, pitcher, you know, what do you want to do? Do you want me to call the game? Uh, do you want to call the game? Do you want to collaborate on it? Maybe you have a signal. I know I've done this in the past where uh, if a catcher of mine sees something in the box where they're like, you know, I have a really strong conviction in this pitch, he'll give me like one of these, like, hey, I, you know, I got, a, I got a reason for calling this. And that gives me confidence because I know once that relationship is built with the catcher and we've talked about, you know, what is he seeing when he, when he gives me that or what's he noticing? And um, when he gives me this, I'm like, okay, Great, great. I'm on board. Whatever he calls, I'll throw it because I know he sees something. Um, other times it's, you know, I shake off and I'll talk to the catcher in between innings. Like, hey, you know, I'm seeing this or I'm seeing that. Like, this is feeling good. That's feeling good today. But this pitch isn't. So I know with a scouting report going in was to throw more of these, but that's really not working for me today. So let's go this way. Basically, it's all about communication. Uh, when the catcher and the pitcher don't talk, things go bad. The more the catcher and the pitcher talk, the better things go. So... Just have open lines of communication. Don't be afraid to bring something up that's, hey, I don't like when you're doing this. Set the glove up here. 
Generally speaking, catchers love hearing that because they want to help the pitcher. Or if the catcher sees something with the pitcher, hey, man, like you throw the fastball too much in these counts. I'm noticing these guys seem to be sitting on it. I heard this. I heard the hitter mutter something under his breath. It, you know, that's great information to have coming back from, from the catcher. So just open the lines of communication and everything should be good. Um, let's see. Question number five is from Robert Christ. And he says, how much, if any, pushback does a professional team or pitching staff give you regarding the pitching mechanics you are doing for yourself? Are you trying to implement something or fix something and the team says to do it their way, but your research tells you to do it another? Do you or can you get in trouble or how much freedom do they let you work or do they give you to work on yourself? This also depends. Um, this is very much dependent on the pitching coach and the organization and also the amount of time that the player has. So for instance, you're a new draftee uh, and you're taken in the 30th round. Uh, generally speaking, you're not gonna get any latitude. You're gonna be told to do a certain thing and if you don't wanna do it, you'll be labeled as uncoachable and threatened to be released, if not released outright. Uh, for me, I had a lot more leeway because I was a first round pick. And so the release button wasn't nearly as close for me. So I could sit there and do things my way. And I generally performed really well in the minors so that the pitching coaches couldn't really tell me, don't do this because you're not good. You got to do it this way and you'll be better because I was good. And so my way was kind of working. Now, when I got to the big leagues and I got hit around and I had a bad year in AAA in 2013, and then um, it came back up in 14 and 15 and wasn't that great and was kind of you know inconsistent and stuff like that. Then I got a lot of pushback. Uh, 2017, I got a ton of pushback in spring training. Um, I think I had, man, it must have been two straight weeks where I had at least an hour-long meeting in spring training, just constantly beating up on me for the way I was doing my mechanics and stuff like that. Um, sometimes I have two hour-long meetings per day in spring training. I'd be there till four or five o'clock in the afternoon, and the, the information that I was getting just wasn't right. Uh, and I held my ground on it, but it caused a lot of problems and soured a lot of relationships and ultimately made me want to quit baseball. I hated it. I hated the situation there. I hated the people I was working with and that were trying to tell me this stuff. And like at some point it just, you know, it boiled over. Um, I told them, you know, flat out, I was not going to meet with them anymore, period. Uh, and just to shut up and let me play and, uh, went into the season super depressed and hating my situation and it took me two or three months that year to, to get out of that mindset. And once I did, I had a lot more success and things were, you know, back to normal. And I was one of the better pitchers in the second half that year. But um, it can be bad. It can be, it can go really south really quickly, uh, especially for people who are as invested in their training as I am and, and in knowing themselves, because I know what works for me. Like I have a, a large knowledge base on biomechanics and my training and how my body functions and what I have and haven't tried and how my body's responded over the, the many number of years. I have data to back all this stuff up. And so when someone comes to me and says, you need to do it this way because I said so, and then they can't answer certain questions uh, that I have to, to back up why they're saying it, I don't want to listen to that person. Uh, so even in the case of like being a big leaguer and being a first round pick, like I've faced a lot of pushback. Now, that being said, once you get to, you know, having four or five years in the league, once you've had one really good year in the league, then no one can really tell you anything anymore. At least that's the perception because you can just look at them and say, I've been successful. Like, this is what I do. Uh, now, that's not how I want things to work. I always want feedback, but I want informed feedback. I want suggestions. I want people to have engaging discussions, not just a top down, hey, I'm in this position and you're below me, so you're going to do what I say. Uh, and I faced plenty of that in my career. So um, some people get along really well that way. Some people don't. Uh, some people get a lot of crap for doing things their way. Some people don't. Um, it can go all sorts of different ways. Uh, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you're in a position that uh, if you're facing that, you know, hopefully it, it goes better for you than it did for me. Question number six, uh, James asks, on the Baseball Tonight with Buster Only podcast, you recently said Barry Bonds would struggle in today's game. I can understand Babe Ruth struggling, but Bonds is not that far removed from the game. What's the thinking behind the statement? Baseball advances super quickly. If you look at the average velocity in 2000 versus the average velocity in 
2019, so basically 20 years later, average league-wide velocity has gone up like four miles an hour. Uh, so back in 2000, when you were watching, like, <laughs> I mean, the best at bat, you know, Gagne and, and Bonds, probably the best at bat in baseball history, at least one of my favorites. You know, Gagne's throwing 100. He's 99 to 100 in that at bat, and it's gas, and it's, you know, Bonds has some defensive swings, and, you know, Bonds ultimately ends up hitting a home run. There's a whole story behind, you know, why that happened. But if we look at all the stats, the more league-wide, the more fastball velocity goes up, the worse hitters perform against it. So if you took peak Barry Bonds, who is facing probably – you know, sinker ballers throwing 91, maybe average velocity, 92, and you put him in today's game and he was facing velocity that's on average, night in, night out, two or three miles an hour harder, he would struggle. There would be a learning curve. Breaking balls are much better today than they were back then because people understand what makes a good breaking ball. Now, sure, there were some breaking balls back then that were just as good as breaking balls today, but on a league-wide basis, people understand what hitters can and can't hit uh, the, the stuff is just better overall, the pitcher's stuff, uh, the analytics are better. So you, you, I mean, you have more information on how to attack guys. Um, you know, no more of the days where pitchers are having to take notes in a, in a book, uh, in, a, in a little booklet and keep it with them for 20 years. Like all this information is cataloged digitally and you have it at the, at your fingertips in between at the bats. There's iPads in the dugout where you can pull this stuff up. You're so well equipped with whatever information you want. So, if you transplanted peak Barry Bonds into today's game, he would struggle. However, he's talented enough that over the course of time, he would adapt and he would then perform well. Human gen genealogy has not advanced that much. There's athletes back in, let's say, I mean, even talking 20 years ago, like some of the athletes were just as good as the athletes are today. There's no doubt. They're just as athletic. But training has gotten better. Velo so velocity has gone up. Information has gotten as crazy how much information there is now so there would be a learning curve i'm sure he would adapt and be good at some point but he would struggle if you just put peak berry bonds in today's game with no adaptation period he would struggle convicted on that and last but not least question number seven it comes from saul rodriguez uh, and he asks what is your opinion on the overall hall of fame process i think the hall of fame process is a great part of baseball history i think being able to look back and compare prior days uh, best players to today's best players is important. That being said, with what I just talked about and the league advancing so much, it's very hard to say that today's... How do you compare Mike Trout from the day to Babe Ruth from yesteryear? Because they were playing in two completely different style games. You know, uh, on the pitcher side, because that's what I know best, it's very unlikely that any pitcher would get the chance to even win 300 games anymore. I mean, you see a lot of pitchers that don't even get 300 starts anymore. Now you're, seeing, you're starting to see openers. You're starting to see pitchers only going five innings facing the lineup maybe two, two maybe three times. So players aren't, just, aren't given the same opportunities because the landscape of the game has changed. So I think in order for the Hall of Fame process to, to work, it needs to be you know, the best players of their era. Like, I mean, I would never want it to be a hard and fast, like, cutoff. But just as a thought exercise, you could take the top 5% or the top 10% of players during their era. And if you were in that, you're a Hall of Famer. And if you're not, you're not. Uh, but it should be modernized in a lot of ways. As far as the voting goes, uh, I think the voting is great. I think it, inv it, it involves the fans um, and, and their opinions. Uh, it involves, obviously, the writers that have a, a pulse on the game. I do think that it needs to be modernized, though. I think that the, the way that, um, you know, who has Hall of Fame votes and stuff like that, I think, should be cycled through a little bit more. Uh, you know, people end up with Hall of Fame votes. They've been writing forever. They're, they're super biased towards the baseball they grew up with and the, the, the way the game was when they grew up. Um, some of them are, some of them aren't. Um, but I, I think that it, just, that it needs to be modernized a little bit. But I like the overall process of it. I think that there's uh, a lot of good that comes from it, a lot of interest. I, I do hate the fact that, you know, one person can vote against someone that's a unanimous Hall of Famer and like just, just you know, just to keep them out. Like those people should go. I feel like if you, if someone gets like 90% of the votes 
to be a Hall of Famer, whoever voted against him should just lose your voting privileges because you clearly don't understand what a Hall of Famer is. Like Derek Jeter or Mariano, I forget, I think it was Mariano that was the first, first ballot Hall of Famer, but, or first like unanimous Hall of Famer. But, I mean, voting against Derek Jeter as, as being a Hall of Famer, strictly just to vote against him and you're the one vote, just get out. You're biased. Yeah, but anyway, those are just my thoughts, some of them. I don't know everything that goes into it either, so I can't speak on it super in detail because you know I just have to preface everything I said with, uh, you know, I don't know everything there is to know about it. So just some off-the-top thoughts to answer your question. All right, that is a lot of your questions, and I have a question for you, and it's going to be very polarizing. So before you answer this, I need to know why. I need a good reason. I need a well-reasoned reason. And I need you to explain it in the comments. Who is more to blame for no baseball right now? Owners, players, or COVID? Let the debate begin. And with that, that is all for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, drop your questions in the comments below. And if you'd like a shout out in a future video, head on over to trevorbauer.com, sign up for my email list, and submit your question on the homepage for a chance to be shouted out. I have a goal of getting to 100,000 subscribers by the end of this year, so it would really help me out if you leave me a like, if you leave a comment, if you subscribe to this channel if you're not already, and if you tell your friends that this channel exists, I'm trying to get as much baseball information out to as many people as possible. So help me out on that. And without further ado, have a great, great day and a great weekend. See you guys in the next one.